Hey everyone, welcome back to the Weekend Charts. I'm your host, Charlie Bellello, and as always, I'm going to take you on a tour of the markets and run through the most interesting charts and themes that we're seeing today. So let's start out by talking about this poll from the Wall Street Journal asking about the next generation. And specifically, they asked this question, do you feel confident that life for our children's generation will be better off than it's been for us. And a lot of people saying no. So 78% said they do not feel confident. That's the highest level that we've seen. They've been doing this poll since 1990. So a lot of negativity about the future. And why are people so worried about our children's generation? Well, the main concern that people cited was inflation. So more than two thirds talking about inflation, talking about things like high housing prices, high healthcare costs, and the fact that wages, especially in recent years, haven't been keeping pace with those higher prices. So interesting response here. I think it's valid concerns for sure, but I think it's important to kind of look at how we got to this point in terms of inflation and perhaps how we can get out of it. And so if we, we're being honest, we have to say that the last 20 years, really, there hasn't been much of a concern whatsoever uh, in terms of borrowing more money and borrowing really from the future to spend more money today. And if we look at the stats in terms of government spending, I think this tells an important story. We have a 185% increase in U.S. government spending over the last 20 years, and that's well above the increase in the overall inflation rate, 64%. So per year, we've seen an increase in government spending more than double the rate of increase in overall U.S. CPI. And of course, that really accelerated in 2020 and 2021 with those enormous stimulus bills. So if we look at the deficits over the years, almost always the U.S. government's running a deficit. And in recent years, that's really just hit record levels. And even today, where the economy is in an expansion, there's very little desire to cut that deficit. So we've seen in recent months, the deficit continuing to increase. We're running about 1.6 trillion today. And uh, what we've seen is, is both parties uh, pursue uh, this deficit spending policies. And why is that? Because the politicians, of course, want to get reelected. That's their primary goal. And in order to do so, they often have to make promises uh, to people and they promise to spend more money than the other party uh, and that helps them get elected so uh, this is a primary reason why we're seeing uh, higher inflation is just this massive fiscal stimulus massive government spending which feels great in the short run uh, but in the long run there's consequences and now we're at that point where we're seeing those consequences of higher inflation and now the other side of the coin here is the federal reserve and what we've seen in terms of monetary policy stimulus and again once again if we're being honest here there's very little pushback from either party or from the american people when the federal reserve was pursuing these ultra easy monetary policies even after the economy came out of that recession uh, during the global financial crisis so you're in 2010 Normally, the Federal Reserve would have started hiking rates at that point. You're in an economic expansion and the crisis is over. Uh, but the Fed chose back then to pursue a policy called the wealth effect, where it said they're going to keep these emergency measures in place and try to prop up asset prices. And very little pushback from people. They're happy to see the Fed do this, happy to see them drive prices up. And they took seven years before they actually would hike rates in December 2015. And when they did, they did so very slowly. Uh, and then, of course, in 2019, they start cutting rates and 2020 move them back to zero, held them at zero for far too long, of course. And now they're just starting to play catch up. And in terms of the Fed's balance sheet, uh, just a huge expansion during the financial crisis. But what we saw thereafter was a few more rounds of quantitative easing again during periods of economic expansion. So what the Fed's doing here is they're artificially suppressing interest rates, boosting prices of homes, boosting prices of assets. Really in 2020, we just saw an unbelievable record increase. But again, when we came out of that COVID recession, Fed continues to do quantitative easing, continue to buy mortgage bonds, suppress interest rates there and drive up cost of housing. So all of these factors are leading to where we are today. And what we've seen in terms of the purchasing power of the dollar because of this inflation, 
is just a complete and utter decline here, 39% decline over the last 20 years. So if you're just keeping your money in a checking account, not very good, of course, because you have this erosion from inflation year in and year out. So the question should be, how do we get out of this? How do we make it so that our children have a chance of having a better standard of living than we have today? Well, really, we have to look at what we're doing today and do the opposite. So if what we're doing today is not working, uh, we should try something different. What that means, of course, is trying to be more fiscally responsible, reduce that deficit, and on the monetary policy side, normalize policy where we don't have these ultra easy policies artificially suppressing interest rates and interfering in the traditional supply demand of markets. So what's the chance of this happening? I think it's going to be an uphill battle, of course, because again, nobody wants to take that short term pain, even if it's going to lead to long term gain, uh, but hopeful uh, that we're going to see this because of course, we all want our children uh, to have a better uh, life than we have today. And to do that, I think it's going to be re required that we take some pain. The generation that benefited from all of these policies, borrowing from the future, is going to have to say, well, enough is enough there. We have to be thinking about that future and start, stop borrowing from it. So the positive side here is that if we're looking at monetary policy, we've seen a 180 degree reversal from where we were just a year ago, we're really moving in the right direction if we look at things like money supply. So this chart tells a very important story. We just saw an unbelievable increase in the money supply in 2020, 2021, 40% increase in the money supply in two years. Now this is fascinating because when you listen to the Federal Reserve, you listen to the press conference, it's almost never spoken about. You never hear a question about the money supply month in and month out they're talking about all, everything else in terms of uh, inflation uh, and policies and things that are causing inflation and perhaps causing a reduction in inflation money supply never mentioned and this is one of the main drivers of that spike in inflation to over nine percent highest we've seen since the early 1980s is this rapid expansion in the money supply good news is finally the fed got the message that inflation was not transitory and they started reversing this very quickly last year. And now actually we're at down 2.4% year over year, which is the largest decline we've seen in this money supply, this M2 data with data going back to 1960. So on the way up, it's leading to higher inflation rates and on the way down, as we've talked about going to lead to lower inflation rates. It's just taking time, but it should continue in the months to come as long as we keep that money supply growth down, or at least not going up. So if we look at the Federal Reserve, this is going to be a big factor in terms of that money supply growth. As we talked about on the last video, there's this huge spike in terms of emergency liquidity that the Fed provided after the SVB failure, $392 billion increase in their balance sheet over just a two week period. So the question is when we get that data for March and M2, are we going to see an expansion in the money supply again? Uh, we won't know until we get that data. It's likely to be some increase, but the bigger question is, is it just a temporary thing? Is the emergency over and will the Fed start to resume their quantitative tightening with the balance sheet declining? And so over the last two weeks, that's pretty much what we saw. We're seeing a reduction in terms of the loans uh, and $100, $101 billion reduction over the last two weeks. So this remains to be seen, of course, if there's going to be additional bank failures, this chart may change. If there's going to be a recession this year, as we'll talk about in a little bit, this chart may change. But I think the Fed wants to continue to reduce that balance sheet. Uh, they just uh, have had this situation with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Uh, that required this huge increase in liquidity in their minds. So I think they want to move it back in this direction because they're still concerned about inflation and we'll see if the markets allow them to do that. So let's talk about the housing market. And this is going to be a huge factor in terms of that first poll and people are most concerned about home prices being unaffordable. And we know how they got to be unaffordable. We had all these policies that pursued driving the price of housing up. 
And now finally, we're moving in the other direction where the Fed is no longer interfering in the mortgage market, no longer buying mortgage bonds each and every month. And we now have a Fed funds rate and interest rate that's uh, more normal in relation to the inflation rate. So if we look at the Case Shiller National Home Price Index, we have data now through January. We saw a seventh consecutive monthly decline. So really just seeing a normalization from what we saw, just an epic boom. As we've talked about, this is the biggest housing bubble if we're looking at prices in relation to income that we ever have seen. It's even bigger than the one that we saw back in the mid 2000s. And now we're seeing the reversal here with just a really a minor pullback so far, 5%, but a big change nonetheless. We haven't seen a 5% pullback over a seven month period. You have to go all the way back to 2011, 2012 to find a decline in the US housing market that's this big. So if we're looking at real time data, this is remember the case shillers only as, as of January, what we're seeing is even bigger declines on a year over year basis down 2.1%. If we're looking at Redfin's data, this is actual sales of homes, looking at the median sales price of homes. And you would expect this to continue, I think in the months that come, because homes are still largely unaffordable, looking at most areas based on incomes, looking at current mortgage rates, uh, they're just wholly unaffordable because of that huge increase in prices and the increase in mortgage rates. So if we're breaking it down by city, what we're seeing here is a uniform decline. So it's not just one particular area that, inc that saw an increase on the way up. It was everything that saw huge increases over the past few years and everything now is seeing an adjustment, but not all cities are the same. You're going to see different rates of, of depreciation going forward. And now we have four major U.S. cities, San Francisco, Seattle, San Diego, and Portland, all showing down year over year home prices. And I suspect we're going to see many more cities join that list in the months to come. San Francisco being the worst housing market down over 13% from its peak last year. So you're going to see more of these cities join uh, uh, these four in the coming months uh, because of that affordability equation. It's simply not there. And so demand for housing has collapsed. If you can't afford a house, can't get a mortgage for that, we can't buy that house at the current price. Prices have to come down uh, to increase demand. And even though there's still a, a supply shortage, uh, when, when the transactions occur, they're occurring at lower prices and you're just seeing this slow repricing of the housing market, which is necessary. I think it's a good thing long-term. Uh, the question is how much uh, will the Fed and the federal government allow it to reprice uh, before they step in again? Hopefully uh, they allow it to reprice because that's one of the concerns for people is that housing is unaffordable. Uh, and so you don't want to artificially step in again uh, like they did the last time and prop the housing market up again. You want to let prices go to a point where it's affordable based on income. So home price is just one part of it. Not everyone, of course, owns a home. Many people rent. And if we're looking at rents, this is a huge factor in terms of inflation uh, combined with home prices. And we're seeing here a deceleration that's pretty rapid uh, and a good sign as well. We're seeing the year over year rent appreciation rate now down to 2.7%. And if we look at rents, uh, they're actually down on, on an absolute basis from their peak last year. So they peaked last August, looking at the average rent in the US and we're below that level today. So I think we're going to see in the coming months, this continue to decline and probably get to flat or even negative uh, in a few months from now. I think that's going to be a huge factor. And that's going to eventually filter into that CPI shelter component, which is a huge component, 34% of CPI. So once we see it reflected and there's a long lag between real time data and that CPI shelter, but once we see that, we're going to see that CPI shelter uh, number come down and then that's going to influence the overall CPI and bring it way down. So good sign there in terms of rents and what we're seeing in terms of vacancies is going to be helpful for that rental price in the months to come. We're seeing a continual increase in the vacancies. So opposite of what we saw in 2020 that was driving prices higher 
we had a shortage of of apartments uh, that were for rent and now we're seeing just each and every month an increase in supply and all signs are really pointing to more supply coming on the way because we're looking at things like u.s housing under construction. these are multi-family units and it's at a record high uh, you know huge increase in ter in terms of building uh, and so supply is coming uh, to meet that demand and that should keep at least the cap in terms of prices, if not uh, uh, further uh, declines that we've seen on an absolute basis. So good news in terms of housing market, very slow repricing, necessary repricing, uh, but hopefully that continues. And then you have inflation expectations here. I think this is a hugely important point because as we talked about a lot of inflation, it's not simply uh, supply and demand thing. That's certainly part of it, but also expectations play an important part uh, in terms of inflation, especially uh, looking at the short run inflation. If people are thinking that prices are going to increase by a high amount, well, they're more tolerant of that increase and that kind of feeds on itself. So what we're seeing here, very good sign. This is a survey put out by the New York Fed in terms of consumer expectations. So asking people, what do you think inflation is going to be over the next year, over the next three years? And as you can see here, we saw a huge spike uh, in 2022 in terms of one year ahead expectations. And now it's really been plummeting lowest since May 2021. So people are saying inflation over the next year, 4.2%. But over the next three years, really a rapid normalization here. People are saying 2.66% per year over the next three years. So good sign consumers are thinking that prices are going to start to normalize. Um, and over the next three years, kind of almost back to the historical average. So I think if the, if, if we can actually see this where inflation averages 2.7% over the next few years, I think the fed would be pretty happy with that. I think given where inflation is, most people would be happy uh, with an inflation rate that, that low. So good sign that expectations are coming down. If we look at the actual data, the latest data point we got was this PCE index that showed a similar decline to what we were seeing, seeing in CPI. So we're down to 5% now on the PCE. Historical average is 2%. We still have more to go, but the expectation is this is going to come down significantly if we look at the March data point. And now we have an effective funds rate that's above the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, which is core PCE. So 4.83% on the effective funds rate, 4.6% in terms of core PCE. Now we're in a tightening stance if we look at Fed policy. And the Fed has room, if they want to, in May, I think, to pause. So the question is going to be, do they feel like this is enough? Uh, is there enough? Is there a lot of concerns over the banking crisis at that point in time? How much has CPI come down? All these factors are going to weigh into whether or not the Fed does another hike or they pause, but certainly it seems like we're getting closer to that point uh, where the Fed can pause and at least see what happens because we know there's a lag between Fed policy and what happens in the real economy. There tends to be a long uh, lag and, and so we're likely to see the impact of all of these rate hikes here uh, happen in the months to come. We haven't seen it just yet, everything that's gonna occur from that. So. If we look at the Cleveland Fed, they put out this model uh, where they uh, essentially anticipate what the inflation rate is going to come in at. And what they're saying for March, I think this is, is probably going to be correct, is we're going to see a big decline in that CPI. So CPI was 6% in February, and Cleveland Fed is expecting that drop down to 5.2% in March. So PCE, similar, seeing a big decline in We've talked about the reasons for this. A lot of it is just looking at year over year rate of change uh, and commodities were spiking last year. If we look at the inflation rate, we had uh, just huge impact from uh, the rising price of crude oil, gasoline, all commodities were spiking last year. And now uh, they've kind of normalized. We'll talk about the price of crude oil in a little bit, but uh, all of these signs are pointing to lower inflation rates ahead. So the question is, is this going to be enough to for the fed to stop hiking rates and then perhaps if the market is correct will the fed pivot and start easing at some point this summer so 
this data is changing every single day. Every time you get a new data point, we're seeing this curve change, but uh, the expectation remains that the Fed is going to cut rates at some point uh, this summer. The market's saying after the payroll report that we got that the Fed will hike one more time in May. And again, that changes with every data point. So if we see a lot of data points in the next few weeks that point to inflation slowing rapidly or more problems in the banking sector, I think the Fed will likely pause at that meeting. But for now, market's saying one more rate hike to five to five and a quarter percent, but then the Fed's gonna start cutting rates in July, starting with a 25 basis point cut, and then continue to cut really throughout the remainder of this year and into next year. And the market's saying Fed funds rate's gonna be below 3% by the end of 2024. Now, again, as I always say, the market is often wrong uh, about these predictions, uh, just as the Fed is wrong about these predictions. And so, with the changing data points, this is going to change, uh, but interesting to see this rapid expectation of a shift in monetary policy. And what this is leading to is the change in the yield curve, really like we haven't seen before. If we're looking at the yield curve uh, and we look at 10 year yields minus three month yields, and we've been talking about this really for a year now in terms of the inversion in the yield curve, uh, and crossing below that zero threshold and just getting more and more inverted. And now we're actually at the most inverted uh, point for this yield curve that we've ever seen in history. So we broke below uh, this level from March, 1980. We now have the three month treasury bill yields 1.61% higher than the 10 year. So pretty remarkable uh, to see that spread. And what's driving that really what's driving it is the expectation um, that the Fed at some point uh, this year and into, into next year is going to start cutting rates, that the economy is going to slow. Uh, and as we've talked about, this inverted yield curve has predicted you know, the, all the recessions here since 1970. We've seen an inversion in the yield curve before that recession. Often there's a considerable, considerable lag between the inversion in the yield curve and the start of the recession. But now we're at a point where it's just so incredibly extreme uh, that unless the Fed continues to hike rates in the months to come, uh, we're not likely to see much more uh, in terms of the spread increasing. And it's likely that we're getting closer to an economic downturn, just looking at history. Back in March 1980, we were, all, we were already in a recession at this point when we're looking at the inversion being this extreme. So. How does this inversion resolve itself? Well, once the Fed starts cutting rates, you see that three month treasury bill yields going to go down, assuming the 10 year stabilizes, then you're going to see the yield curve start to steepen. And as we talked about in the last video, it's that actual steepening that's been the signal uh, that the recession is about to begin because you see the Fed starting to cut rates, move in the other direction markets expecting further cuts and then the yield curve all of a sudden steepens instead of moves in the other direction of of inversion so very unusual situation that we're seeing today and it's really driven by the expectation that the fed's going to start cutting rates because there's going to be an economic slowdown and because also inflation is under control so we'll see if those expectations uh, are going to be met if they're correct, we'll monitor this pretty closely in the coming months. But in terms of that recession question, I think the evidence continues to build. We talked about the housing market, of course, has been in a recession for over a year now. If you look at housing activity, uh, anything related to the housing market just absolutely crushed. Um, but we're seeing broader, other broader measures start to build in terms of recessionary indicators. Uh, we talked about retail sales, numbers if we if we include inflation look at real real retail, real retail sales are down year over year uh, for many months in a row now and now we're seeing the manufacturing sector kind of get to levels where we've seen recessions in the past uh, this u.s manufacturing pmi is a survey uh, and asking about manufacturing activity we're at levels where in 2020 financial crisis back in 2001 that we were at or in a recession. And so you have to go back to 1995, 1996 to find 
this manufacturing PMI at these current levels where the U.S. was not in a recession. So the question is, is the manufacturing sector that important where if we see a downturn in manufacturing, there has to be a downturn in the overall U.S. economy? And the answer is no. Uh, manufacturing uh, in the U.S., if we look at value added as a percentage of GDP, is around 11%. So you can have a manufacturing downturn without a downturn in the overall U.S. economy. Manufacturing is just one part of it. Obviously, services much more important component uh, in terms of the U.S. economy. Uh, but just another signal here, another indicator. And the difference, of course, between now and 1995, 1996 is in 1995, 1996, you didn't have that inverted yield curve. You didn't have the housing market in a recession. You didn't have the Fed aggressively hiking interest rates to try to curb inflation. So a lot more factors today kind of pointing to a slowdown than back then. And here's just one more thing to look at, again, that we didn't have in 1995, 1996, was banks tightening their lending standards. And that's something we've seen consistently uh, in the last four recessions is this increase in tightening in terms of lending standards. So looking at loans, commercial loans, industrial loans, we're seeing a pretty rapid increase in that tightening uh, from banks. And that's what you tend to see around recessions. So we'll watch this indicator as well closely in the coming months. And you would think that the Silicon Valley bank failure and the problems in the banking sector will likely, likely lead to further tightening, at least in the next few data points. So again, another data point pointing to potential weakness. So what's the, what's the argument that we're not in a recession and that, that perhaps there's going to be a longer lag between that yield curve inversion and the start of a recession? Well, continues to be the good news from the jobs market. We're seeing another month of jobs growth in the U.S. is the 27th consecutive jobs uh, growth in, in the U.S. And uh, what we're seeing is an unemployment rate that's really not consistent with recession. Now, this is not a leading indicator. It's more of a coincident to lagging indicator. So even when the recession begins, you're not going to see this uh, spike up immediately. But still, at 3.5%, uh, we're near the lowest that we've been since 1969, which was 3.4% uh, in January. So still very low uh, uh, unemployment rate. And we're seeing the participation rate continue to creep back up. So we're now up to 62.6%. That's the highest since March 2020. So really a normalization of the labor market, which is a good thing. Now, at the same time, we're seeing some signs of loosening and we're seeing job openings come down here. Again, they were just at record highs and they stayed up here for a while. But now we're starting to see somewhat of a meaningful decline here below 10 million for lowest since May 2021. And if we look at that spread, which is really important between job openings and unemployed, again, starting to normalize here, we're just under 4 million, still pretty wide before the pandemic, we're at around 1.2 million, so still pretty wide. Uh, but again, slow normalization here, and that will likely lead to a slower rate of wage inflation, which is a pretty important indicator here. If we look at hourly earnings in that latest job report, we saw a 4.2% increase. That's the lowest that we've seen in some time. And if the labor market is indeed loosening, well, you're not going to have the same pressure, uh, upward pressure on wages. And that's going to help, of course, with the overall inflation rate, rate as well, and likely help to bring it down in the months to come. So still very pretty strong labor market. If we're, we're looking at it overall, continued jobs growth, we still have that real gap uh, between job openings and the number of unemployed. So we could see could certainly uh, continued jobs growth in the month to come. The question is, when do we get to that point where it starts to look more like a recession and every cycle is different. And because of all the factors uh, around the pandemic, this is certainly going to be different than any other cycle as well, because simply you still have many industries that are lacking workers. And until that, uh, that demand for workers is met, you could still see jobs growth in those industries while you see cuts in other industries. And that's what we've seen pretty much over the last 
year is service industries, especially in hospitality area, continue to hire workers while the tech sector is uh, laying off workers and, and you're seeing continued job cuts there. So kind of a bifurcation here in the labor market, but overall on net, we're still seeing the labor market uh, showing uh, increases in jobs. So I want to talk about money market funds here and what we saw following that uh, Silicon Bank, uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank failure was just a huge transfer in, in uh, capital with money moving out of banks. So deposits fell 363 billion and into money market funds, which saw a $304 billion increase. And so why are money market fund assets going up? Why are people taking money out of banks? Well, I think, you, you know, part of the reason they're worried about another bank failure, perhaps that bank won't be bailed out like the, uh, we saw with SVB and Signature Bank. Uh, so if you have money above that FDIC insurance uh, limit of 250000 you're now more concerned. It's more front and center. And so that's part of the reason. But the other part of the reason is simply the interest rate that you're getting on money market funds is around 5% now. And that's something we haven't seen in a long time. And if you're just leaving your money in the checking account at a bank, you're likely receiving still next to nothing. So I think that's uh, uh, causing obviously this massive uh, shift in flows from bank deposits to money market funds. And if we look at uh, the Fed's, uh, the Fed's uh, repo, reverse repo facility, we're seeing a huge uh, number of assets there. So those money market mutual funds are investing in these reverse repos where they can hold money at the Fed and receive 4.8% annualized uh, interest. If the Fed hikes again, that will only go up. Uh, so we're, we're seeing uh, just a kind of a rational shift here where people want to earn more money on their cash that that was just sitting in an account. And if they're in a money market mutual fund, that's a segregated asset. Does it matter uh, if if the institution fails? It's a segregated fund uh, and uh, people are viewing that, that as a safer bet than leaving money in an, uh, above that FDIC insurance uh, limit. They're viewing it as a safer option and they're viewing it as a better option because they're getting this much higher yield. Now, the money that stayed in the banking system. So of course you still have massive number of deposits in banks. Uh, and, uh, what we've seen is just a transfer from small to big. And so big outflows out of small banks into big bigs. And we've talked about the reason for this, but it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, people are viewing the larger banks as too big to fail after some of the comments from Johnny Yellen. Uh, talking about uh, systemic risk, saying if a bank failure poses systemic risk, then they would do something similar uh, to what they did with SVB and Signature Bank. And so the presumption is if it doesn't, the failure doesn't pre uh, present a systemic risk, then perhaps they would let it fail. And so as a result, we're seeing, again, a rational move here out of small banks into larger banks. And we'll see how much that continues. Uh, if you're under that 250,000 limit, of course, you don't have that same concern. You don't have that same urge to move it. But if you're looking at businesses and, and uh, high net worth individuals, I think that's where you're seeing this, these flows come from. So interesting here, small to big. And what's interesting in the equity market is we're seeing something similar. So if we look at small cap equities relative to large cap. So just the ratio of the Russell 2000 small cap index to the S&P 500, we're seeing just a sharp move lower, sharp underperformance of small caps over the last month. And now if we look at this ratio on a longer term basis, uh, with the exception of March 2020, where we saw just an absolute collapse during the COVID crash in small caps, with the exception of that, you have to go all the way back to February 2001 to find this ratio at this level. So pretty long period now of underperformance of small caps versus large caps. If we look at the last 10 years, large caps, S&P 500 up 214%, small caps up 115%. So not a bad return for small caps, still 8% per year, but large caps significantly outperforming around 12% annualized in the last decade. And I thought this was really an interesting stat here. If you look at the two biggest companies in the US, we have Apple and Microsoft, 
and their combined market cap is 4.69 trillion, just a huge number for two companies. And that number is actually $2 trillion higher than all of the companies, all of the small cap companies in that Russell 2000 index. So incredible stat that just two companies, Apple and Microsoft are bigger than 2000 companies in the Russell 2000. And so the question you might ask is, well, is this irrational? Is this justified uh, based on the fundamentals? And I think you can make an argument either way, depending on what metric that you're looking at. So if you're looking at revenues, the combined revenues of Apple and Microsoft, 591 billion, much lower the than the combined uh, revenues of the Russell 2000 companies at 2.5 trillion. So uh, what's simply going on there is Apple and Microsoft are trading at much higher uh, price to sales multiples uh, than the average company in the Russell 2000, which is trading at just a little over one time sales. So uh, if you're looking at that metric, you might say, well, small caps are cheap relative to these mega cap tech companies, expectations for revenue growth are too high for these mega cap companies and perhaps too low uh, for the Russell 2000 small cap companies. But if we look at net income, we look at profits, it tells really a different story. Combined net income of Apple and Microsoft, 163 billion. That's more than three X higher than the 54 billion for the Russell 2000 index. So 40% of the companies in that small cap index re actually reported a net loss over the last year. So a lot of smaller companies, not yet profitable. And so if we're looking at a price to earnings multiple, perhaps you would say, well, this is justified because uh, Apple and Microsoft are actually making money. They're trading at a lower multiple than the aggregate of the Russell 2000. So Depends on how you look on it. You could say this is either uh, makes sense or it doesn't make sense. And uh, interesting just to see this relationship over time. There's There used to be something that people talked about in terms of small cap premium, the idea that small caps uh, outperform over time. That was really um, said to be one of the anomalies in markets. But in recent years, if you look at the data, it's kind of disproven that we're not seeing that over long-term outperformance kind of been eroded uh, in recent years. Uh, if we look at a long-term average, we're not seeing a uh, better return from small caps it, unless you include things like value. So if you look at small cap value, then you do tend to see a premium over uh, large caps in general. But just looking at, at small caps, kind of the data and evidence has changed. And, and the belief is that you're not necessarily compensated for taking that higher risk in small caps over a long period of time. But that's, that's not to say that small caps can outperform going forward. We've seen cycles uh, in both directions and that will likely continue as well. And maybe we're getting closer to a point where we're hitting a cycle low in terms of small caps versus large, large caps. So I wanna talk about now about another interesting survey from the Wall Street Journal asking about the cost of a college education, which everyone knows has been skyrocketing. And they asked people this poll in 2013, 2017, now again in 2023, asking, is a four-year college degree worth the cost? And for the first time, a majority, 56% said not worth the cost. So interesting shift in terms of attitudes over the last 10 years. And I suspect if you went back even further, you would see uh, an even further shift. And I think the big reason for that is that the cost of a college education has just become absolutely insane. If we look at the college tuition and fees over the last 30 years, we're seeing a quadrupling in the price of college tuitions and fees. And that is not just from the, an increased inflation, we're actually seeing overall CPI only up 110% over the last 30 years. So this is not just due to higher inflation. So let's say higher, uh, you know, costs of employees and everything else. This is well above what can be explained uh, just from higher prices. And we've talked about in the past, uh, what are the reasons for this unbelievable increase? A big part of it is just the subsidization, uh, the manipulation of, uh, of the free market, where if you subsidize a good, you're going to drive up its cost because you don't have the same incentive from the colleges or from the people going to these colleges. 
uh, to try to find a lower price, a price that makes sense based on supply and demand. So you have this distorted market, it's actually leading to higher prices. And then you have, of course, just administrative costs and amenities at colleges increasing over time. And the result is that people are starting to realize that this is uh, this doesn't make sense uh, for uh, certainly for certain certain degrees uh, that you're not compensated to, uh, for that huge cost uh, if if you're not going to be able to earn just a an income that can pay back uh, that cost that you need to borrow it so hopefully this is an industry that will be disrupted in the years to come with technology there doesn't seem to be any reason why this rapid rate of in increase above the rate of inflation should continue Technology should make uh, education uh, much more affordable in the years to come. There's just so many ways you can scale uh, this without uh, huge increases in prices. So hopefully that will be the result and people uh, will view a college uh, degree uh, more favorably in years to come. So let's talk about a housing bubble that's way, way more extreme than the U.S. housing bubble. And that's uh, the Canadian home price bubble. And this is just an unbelievable statistic. Looking at Canadian home prices over the last 20 years, it's almost uh, insane to look at. Um, before the peak last year, you saw a 370% increase. But still, even after a decline, we're at 301% over the last 20 years. If you look at Canadian inflation in the past 20 years, 49%. So well above the level of just overall price increases. Uh, and just really a bubble of epic proportions. And uh, there's many reasons why this happened in Canada. And to be clear, this is not everywhere in Canada. It's really concentrated in the major cities where the major population centers are. Uh, but looking at just an overall index, which includes that those index, we've just seen those cities, we've just seen a phenomenal increase and you have many factors, some of them similar to the U.S., so just distorted monetary policy, you know, low interest rates, you have the same type of increases in the money supply, rapid increases in the money supply, so many of the same policies, but you also have this huge demand, particularly Asia and China, coming into Canada, trying to get money out of those markets into Canadian housing, and those people are less sensitive to uh, prices. Uh, and so it's not reflective of local wages. And as a result, we saw uh, many of these provinces put a tax on foreign purchases of real estate. I think that's had some of an impact here in terms of bringing prices down, but just so extreme in these areas, there's really no relationship at all whatsoever uh, based on people's incomes that are living in those areas relative to those home prices. So how much of a decline are we gonna see here? That's the big question really just at the early stages here of a decline, 4.7% year over year. That's the biggest since the financial crisis. But as this year goes on, I think you're gonna see this obviously set new records. And the question is gonna be similar to the aftermath of the US housing bubble. How much of a decline will the policymakers tolerate before they try to prop it back up again? But I don't think, uh, I don't think a 20, 30, 40% decline would be nothing given that rate of increase. So quickly, I want to talk about throwing stones in glass houses. Federal Reserve at their last FOMC meeting was talking about Silicon Valley Bank and saying how the management there was negligent. They didn't manage in interest rate risk. They didn't hedge that risk. They really did uh, the wrong thing, which is, of course, true. They had this huge duration risk in their portfolio. And of course, with interest rates going up, that was going to lead to a collapse the value of those securities, which if they were held to maturity, they would have received par for. These are treasuries and MBS, but uh, they were forced to sell uh, part of that portfolio. They took a $1.8 billion loss at Silicon Valley Bank, and the rest is history. Of course, the, the, the regulators stepped in, shut it down after you just saw this massive run on the bank. But interesting that the Fed would comment about the... Uh, negligence of the management there in terms of not hedging their interest rates when the Fed is doing the exact same thing and just on a much more massive scale. The Fed has an unrealized loss on their treasury and MBS securities. So same securities that Silicon Valley Bank had problem with. They have an unrealized loss, the Fed, of over $1 trillion. So it makes 
it makes what was going on at Silicon Valley Bank seem like nothing. Now, of course, the difference being that the Fed is not a forced seller. They can hold these securities to, to maturity. Uh, but the notion that uh, the Fed uh, is somehow uh, omniscient and they could avoid uh, what happened at Silicon Valley Bank doesn't seem to be true. They were subject to the same exact thing. And in part, they, of course, caused that by hiking interest rates so rapidly over the last year. They caused the own losses on their balance sheet. So uh, the Fed, not like a regular bank, as we said, because they make their own rules. They can essentially create money out of thin air and they never have to sell these securities. So it, it's good to be the Fed, but just a interesting little bit of hypocrisy in terms of the language that they're using uh, and they have the exact same thing going on in their own uh, balance sheet so let's quickly touch on opec uh, this goes this happens from time to time price of oil gets too low for their liking and they say we're going to cut production so they announced the million barrel per day cut that's going to start in may and we saw Crude jump a little bit here, you know, had hit a low of $65 a barrel here just a few weeks ago. So, so a little bit of a jump here, but I think the uh, important point here is that crude oil is still down year over year. And if we can stabilize here, we don't see a rapid move back up in the next few months, we're going to see that year over year rate of change show an even bigger decline. So OPEC, just one part of a global market, they can't control uh, the price of crude oil by themselves. It's many different countries, U.S. included in that, and supply and demand is going to dictate that. And really, w the direction of crude oil is really going to be dictated uh, you know, by whether there's a global downturn in the months to come. So if we see a recession in the U.S., recession elsewhere in, in the world, we're going to see uh, the price of crude oil likely to decline. You just see that demand collapse uh, a response like we saw back in 2008 is just a decline in crude oil. But if that doesn't happen, anyone's guess, predicting the price of crude oil, always been a fool's game. Don't try to do it. <laughs> so uh, we'll see what happens with crude oil. But interesting to see that even with this jump here, still a pretty sizable year over de year decline. And that's going to filter into that March uh, CPI number when it comes out next week and likely we're going to see a big drop there. So Alibaba, big news that was uh, announced is that they're going to break up the company into six, six different parts. Uh, all of those different uh, parts are going to be able to raise capital and perhaps have IPOs and become separate companies. Um, so there's some optimism there. The share price bounced a little bit. Uh, but longer term, if you look at Alibaba back to its IPO in 2014, it's just been a terrible investment overall. It did have a period of gains here, but if we compare it to Amazon, it's not even close. Amazon, obviously, it's U.S. competitor, uh, you know, closest comp, let's say, up 530%, Alibaba up 10% since its IPO, and a lot of different things driving that. Of course, uh, number one, Alibaba was extremely overvalued in September 2014 there was so much demand for china's chinese tech at that time they were paying investors were paying well over 20 times sales for alibaba back then and while sales did grow during this period and grow pretty significantly that multiple did not so that multiple comes down the price you pay matters alibaba investors now paying much less on a price to sales ratio than back then so even though revenues grew uh, you had this uh, 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 poor return because of that multiple contraction. And so important lessons that lesson that you price you pay ultimately matters. Now, now will this help uh, with Chinese equities? I think the optimistic view is that uh, this signals a change. You had Jack Ma, he was involved in this. And of course, last year, Jack Ma disappears. You have the fear that China is not going to allow these tech big tech companies to get any bigger. So a lot of fears around that uh, and many different ramifications of that. But we saw just a complete collapse. Alibaba's stock still 67% below its peak from 2020. So even with this jump, still well below the, the peak. Uh, but when it comes to China, predicting these things is impossible. They can change their mind at any point in time. Is this bullish or bearish? Hard to say. But I think appropriately now, if we look at these Chinese tech companies, they're finally 
trading at a discount to their U.S. counterparts, where for many years they were trading at a premium. And I think that discount is justified given really the binary risk that you can't predict, which is what the uh, CCP is going to do uh, in terms of uh, are they going to be favorable to these companies? Are they going to nationalize them? Are they going to do things that are favorable to shareholders or not? It's impossible to predict that uh, with any type of certainty. And so we'll see if this leads to a change here and we see a rally here. Obviously, Alibaba, one of the biggest Chinese companies, uh, maybe this this shift here, if it continues and they do it with other companies as well, maybe this will signal uh, more favorable market conditions for not just Alibaba and Chinese stocks, but overall emerging markets, which have significantly lagged uh, U.S. equities over more uh, over more than a decade now. So huge, huge uh, dispersions in term, uh, 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 terms of U.S. equity returns and emerging market equity returns. And are we near a shift where it's going to start moving in the other direction is the question. So I want to end with something positive like I always do. A year ago, there is no alternative. There's no yield for savers. Inflation was very high. You had your money in a savings account. You were earning nothing. And you had the double whammy of inflation being extremely high. Today, much better position for savers. You can get now 5% on an FDIC insured savings account or money market account. And you don't have to take any additional risk to get that. You just have to open that account, link it to your checking account. Uh, so much better position for savers. Not quite at the inflation rate yet. We're looking at the CPI at 6%. But if those consumer expectations are correct, inflation is going to be lower in the next year. You're finally going to be earning more on your cash uh, than uh, what the inflation rate is increasing. That's a very good thing for a lot of people. And for the first time, really, since 2007, you can earn 5% on your cash. So I'm going to end it there. Have a great weekend, everyone. Happy Easter. Happy Passover. If you like the content, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.